Good morning. Please join me for a word of prayer. Abba Father, thank you. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for your great love. A love that knows no bounds. A love that continues to pour out each and every day. Thank you for the breath of life, the very gift of life. The Father, not just for the life we have here on this earth, but for the life we have through your Son, Jesus. Thank you for him and for the work that he did on our behalf on the cross as he stood in our place and as he took our sin upon his shoulders, paying the debt that, that we owe, the debt that we could never repay. And thank you is just not enough, but I pray you see our hearts and know the truth of how we feel. Father, continue to be with this nation and the nations of this world. It's a world that is in turmoil. It's in a world that needs you. It's, in a, it's a world that needs a revival. And Father, we pray that revival begins with us. Be with those who are not with us today, whether it be because of illnesses or relationships or spiritual or emotional struggles or just indifference. Father, we pray that you would touch each life as only you can, that you would bring a knowledge of your presence and your love and your grace to each one, and that through that you would bring healing in your way, in your time, for we know that it is right and it is true and it is perfect. Father, for each of us that have gathered here, we too carry many struggles and burdens in our lives. Help us to surrender them to your care today. To know of your great love and your desire to lift that burden. To hear the words of our Savior as he spoke. Come to me. All you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Father, help us to rest today. Just now, would you steal our minds, calm our spirits, open the eyes of our heart to see, open our ears to hear, all that you have prepared for us this day. Set me aside, Father. Speak your truth. And may your spirit move in this place today as he intercedes and interprets all that is said into each life. We ask all this in the precious name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus. Amen. Well, today we continue in understanding Jesus more through his teachings. We spent two weeks looking at elements of his famous sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. And last week we, we looked at what many would consider his most well-known parable. That of the lost son or the prodigal son. This morning, I believe that we turn to what is likely his second most known parable. 
at least it should be, it's recorded in all three of the synoptic gospels. We're going to look at it from the, the text in Matthew 13, but it's the parable of the sower. I'm not going to spend a, a great mil- amount of time delving into sharing with you the words of that parable. I'm going to encourage you sometime today, if you have not already read Matthew 13, take it out. Read it. Drink in what the Lord has to say. Because he's teaching us even today through that very same parable. The word parable, as we learned last week, simply means a a usually short, oftentimes fictitious story which illustrates a moral or religious principle. This morning's parable carries multiple elements, and, and I'll be honest with you, I've preached a sermon on every one of them. One sermon at a time. Because we can learn from them. But today I want to hopefully maybe look at this parable a little bit different. This parable has a sower. Refers to the one who takes God's word. In this case, likely Jesus, but in, in elements we can apply that to our lives. We've been called to be ministers. This parable has seeds. Jesus himself, in the explanation as, he, as it's recorded in the Gospel of Luke, says the seed that's being spread is the word of God. The great commission for us is go into all the world and preach the gospel, plant the seed. And then interestingly enough, there are four soil types. That's kind of where I want to land today, but for a different reason than the type of soil. It'll play a role in what we share. But I think it's about the message Jesus has always shared. It's about that message of God's kingdom. You see, Jesus' message never changed the whole time he was here on the earth. He came to proclaim the kingdom of God. And he does so even through this parable. Because what he does is he explains that in these various soils, fall countless numbers of people. There really are only two kinds of people that Jesus speaks to, those on the inside, we've talked about them, and those on the outside, and we've talked about them. And Jesus drills in a little bit further to try and help us understand this picture of those who are in God's kingdom and those who are outside and and why. It has a lot to do with are we prepared to hear God's voice? Are we properly tuned to the right frequency? Or are we listening to something else? Stories told of a Native American and his friend who were in downtown New York City. They were walking near Times Square. We've all seen pictures of that. Picture Times Square on New Year's Eve. It's packed. Millions of people. This particular day, it was during the noon hour, so everybody was out hustling and bustling, trying to get into the various restaurants or bodegas or whatever. And so the the streets were extremely busy. They were filled with people. There were cars driving up and down the streets. And if you've ever been to New York, you know they love their horns. They just do. They'll lay on them. Get out of the way. I'm busy. Taxi cabs were squealing around corners. Sirens were wailing. And the sounds of the city were almost deafening. Suddenly, the Native American said, I hear a cricket. His friend is shocked. What? You must be crazy. You can't possibly hear a cricket in the middle of all of this 
noise. No, said the Native American. I'm, I'm sure of it. I heard a cricket. That's crazy, said the friend. The, the Native American listened carefully for a moment, and then he walked across the street to a big cement planter where some shrubs were, were growing. He looked into the bushes beneath the branches. He pulled back the leaves, and sure enough, there located in the, in the, the dirt was a cricket. His friend was amazed. That's incredible, his friend said. You must have superhuman hearing. No, said the Native American. My ears are no different than yours. My ears are no different than yours. Don't miss that. Then he said this, it all depends on what you're listening for. But that can't be, said his friend. I could never hear a cricket in the noise. Yes, it's true, came the reply. It depends on what is really important to you. Here, let me show you. He reached into his pocket. He pulled out a few coins, and he discreetly dropped them on the sidewalk. And then with the noise of the crowded streets still blaring in their ears, they noticed every head within 20 feet turned and looked to see if the money that trickled on the pavement was theirs. It depends on what frequency you're listening to, what you will hear. See what I mean, asked the Native American. It all depends on what is important to you. Jesus said it a different way. As he shared in the Sermon on the Mount, you recall those words, I hope. They're found in Matthew, the sixth chapter, verse 21. It reads like this. For where your treasure is, there your heart is also. Or maybe a better way, where your heart is, is the things you focus on. It's the things you chase. It's the things you wrap up your life up in. The Bible mentions the heart almost a thousand times. In essence, this is what it says. The heart is the spiritual part of us where our emotions and desires dwell. It's the seat of our understanding where we begin to comprehend the, the things that, that God would share with us. And it is what determines the things that are most near and dear to us. It is what directs and drives our lives forward. What our heart wants is where we spend the greatest amount of our time. Whether it, it be in learning something, or simply in those, those moments where we just want to be where whatever it is, is. Jesus' parable would then only be truly heard. Any of his parables, not just this one. But it could only be truly heard and understood by those whose hearts were tuned to him. Those whose hearts were focused, dialed in to the right frequency. Jesus responds to the disciples as, as they ask. After he shared this, this parable of the sower and the seeds and the various soils, and he, he draws away, and it's just him and his disciples, and in secret they say, Lord, why do you speak in parables, and, and what does it mean? And Jesus recites the words of the prophet Isaiah. They're found recorded there in Matthew, the 13th chapter, beginning in, in verse 14, the latter part of it, and running through 17. It says, in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah. You will be ever hearing 
but never understanding. You will be ever seeing, but never perceiving. For the people's heart has become calloused. They hardly hear with their ears, and they have closed their eyes. Otherwise, they might see with their eyes, hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, and turn, and I would heal them. But blessed are you. Blessed are your eyes because they see and your ears because they hear. For truly I tell you, many prophets and righteous people long to see what you see but did not see it. And to hear what you hear but did not hear it. And it's all because they weren't tuned to the right frequency. Their hearts were not focused on God. They were elsewhere. You see, Jesus' parables both concealed and revealed at the same time. Same story, same information. Some understood and some didn't. And the disciples wondered why. And Jesus simply says, those who know me, those who seek me, those who pursue me will hear and understand. Those who are more focused on all the distractions around them will miss the message. So most of the crowd that day didn't hear and didn't understand. We need to understand who the crowd was. To do that, you had to go back to chapter 12. And we've seen that chapter in our journey through Quest. It's the account of the Pharisees after Jesus had healed a man on the Sabbath, accusing him of healing under the name of Satan. And Jesus would then withdraw after confronting the Pharisees. So, so part, of the, part of the group were the Pharisees. And he would withdraw, and he, he would likely go, because he's in Capernaum, to the house of Simon Peter. And the disciples would gra- gather around him in a large circle. And when we say disciples, we're not talking about just the twelve. They were there. But those who believed, truly believed, and followed Jesus with their whole heart were were in the house listening to him. But there was also a large crowd outside. And do you remember who was in that crowd? Because it was a whole bunch of people, but we're specifically told that standing outside was Jesus' mother and his brothers, and his sisters. So you have a picture of the Pharisees. You have a picture of those on the outside. Those two are are groups that right now are not understanding what Jesus is sharing. And then you have the group in Peter's house that are focused on one thing and one thing only. Jesus Christ. And they began to understand. But even then, there are times when we struggle, isn't there? You see, they, those on the outside had tuned their hearts to the things of this world. Not everything was bad except it pushed Christ out of the center. And so they were focused on the things of this world, and there were times when that was true of even those on the inside. You remember the account of of Peter's great confession? Just shortly after that, Jesus would begin to teach about his need to go to the cross and to die. And Peter pulled Jesus aside and he rebuked him, we're told. He said, this won't happen. This will never be. 
I want you to hear the words of Jesus back to Peter. He turned to Peter and he said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are a hindrance to me, for you are setting your mind on the things, not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. In that moment, Peter had lost sight of the kingdom. And he was thinking of self. And he was thinking of world. And Jesus called him on it. Peter, you've lost the frequency. You, you need to re, retune. Turn that dial a little bit, Peter. Get back on the right page. Think of the things of God. Jesus didn't share his parables to to keep people confused. That wasn't his purpose. That, that wasn't his desire. His heart was that all would come to know him. Yet they were clueless because they tuned to a frequency other than that of the kingdom of heaven. They chose instead to listen to others and, and worldly things. They chose to seek Instead of understanding of Jesus, fame and fortune and wealth. And their heart wasn't tuned to God. Jesus, in his explanation of this parable to the disciples, I think makes it clear that there are certain factors we, we need to understand, we need to recognize in our lives, because if they're an element of our lives, then we will struggle hearing and understanding God's good and perfect will for our lives. Where He would have us to go, how He would have us to live. So Jesus sits down with the disciples and He begins to explain the meaning of this parable. And we, we find that in the last part of of the story of this parable. It's found in Matthew 13, verses 18 through 23. And I want you to notice, I've underlined them on the slide, if the, if the slides are up. They're not in the back, I don't know why, and that's okay, we'll get by. I don't need them, I don't think. Look how many times these three words show up. Hear the words, okay? Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. That is what was sown along the path. As for what was sown on rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy. Yet he's he has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And then when tribulations and persecution come or arise on, on account of the word, immediately he falls away. As for those sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but cares of the world and, and the deceitfulness of riches choke the word and it proves unfruitful. As for what is sown on good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields in one case a hundredfold, in another case sixty, and in another case thirty. And I think if we'll unpack this just a little, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it, but I think if we unpack each one of these soils just a little, we'll see all three audience members being addressed by Jesus and why most of them didn't hear and understand and why one group did. And then we've got to ask, which of these are we? I believe that when Jesus speaks of the, the, the path, the, the hard, firm, packed ground, it's those that, that are so anchored in their belief, no matter how wrong it may be, that nothing you say will ever sink in. 
He reminds me a little bit of the Pharisees. Now, the Pharisees did a lot of good. Don't, we beat up on the Pharisees, and, and there's justifiable reasons for doing that. Jesus confronted them more than anybody. Yet they were, they were people who, who studied the writings of God or the writings of Scripture, and they, and they trusted Him. And yet, they leaned more on themselves. You see, the, the Pharisees knew the Torah. They knew it. It's the law of God. And then they also knew the moral law, those that would then be written over the course of time, some 630 of them, something like that, to help understand the Torah. And nothing was more important to the Pharisees than the Torah. In essence, that was their God. Even when Jesus came and He began to explain, remember He said in the Sermon on the Mount, you've heard it said, but I say. The Pharisees rejected it. They didn't want to hear it. They wouldn't hear it. They couldn't hear it. And so the Word never penetrated. It never took root. It never grew. How many of us at some time in our life were just like that? So resistant that we couldn't hear God. So set in our ways, it didn't matter what anybody said. It didn't matter that they shared God's truth with us. Nope, don't want to hear it. I don't have time for your God stuff. They're tuned to the wrong frequency. Are there areas in your life where you are so anchored in, in the law of this world that you don't want to hear God's truth? I believe there are some churches out there today that are. They're not tuned to the right frequency. The rocky soil seems to me to represent those who, who sit and listen to the, the message and even possibly during it, you'll hear them say an amen or a hallelujah or a praise the Lord. But then they go out into the world and, and they see a friend. And as excited as they were about what they had just heard, they see that friend and they think, oh, if I share that with him, he'll no longer be my friend. I have a sad story. When I was doing weekend ministry while at Johnson Bible College in a little church in, in Sharps Chapel, Tennessee, we had a young lady that came to us and said, oh, Oh, I really want to be baptized, but I can't. Why not? Because if I go to school and I, and I tell my friends that I've been baptized, they'll want nothing to do with me. And it didn't matter how long we, we tried to talk with her and to share the love of Christ and the truth and the importance. She couldn't get past what her friends would think. She was tuned more to the frequency of her friends than to that of God. And she could not hear more than just a quick message and it was gone. We see evidence of that in, in Jesus' teaching found in the Gospel of, of John as, as Jesus has, has spoken about Him being the bread of life. And in John 6, beginning in verse 64, we found the, these words. We find these words. But there are some of you who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the beginning who those 
were who did not believe and who it was who would betray him. And he said, This is why I told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted to him by my Father. After this, many of his disciples, those who, who claimed to, to follow him, who had sat and learned at his feet, after this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer walked with him. Their frequency wasn't tuned to where it needed to be. They missed the message of Jesus Christ that in him is life and in him is the reward of the kingdom of heaven. Instead, they were more focused on the things of this world. They became outsiders. And then there's the thorny soil that speaks of those who are turned, have tuned to the frequency of, of their, their own selfishness, if you will, their, their own health and their own wealth. As long as things are going well, as long as they're in good health, they're happy and they're content and they'll be glad to listen to the message of Jesus. But the minute troubles come, maybe it's that diagnosis of cancer. Parkinson's. MLS, heart disease, the list goes on and on. Then they become angry at God instead of turning to Him. I can't believe that a God would allow this to happen in my life. Or their position in the community, their fame, their wealth, their, their power, their authority gets, gets threatened. And instead of turning to God to help walk through these struggles and loving those who, who maybe are on the attack, they turn their look inward and say, what can I do to make sure I don't lose all of this? God said, Jesus said, seek first my kingdom, my righteousness, and all these things will be given you. Which frequency are you tuned to? We have evidence of that in Scripture as well. You remember the, the rich young lawyer? Jesus, what must I do to be to inherit the kingdom of God. And Jesus says, well, what does the Ten Commandments, or what does the law say? And he, he recites them, and, and the lawyer says, I've kept all of these since I was a kid. And Jesus looks at him and says, you lack one thing. Go and sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and come, follow me. And Scripture says, he went away sad. Because he had much. He didn't want to lose it. He didn't want to hear what God had to say. And he chose not to follow it. Or, or the rich young fool. This, this farmer that had got such a great harvest. Then he went out and tore down his barns and he built bigger ones to hold all of the grain. And then he goes to his house and he says, I'm good for life. I'll just sit back and, and coast and enjoy life because I've got plenty. He was focused on things instead of what mattered. And we're told, Scripture says, that he was told, you fool, tonight your life will be required of you. And all of that 
was worthless. They were tuned to their own frequency, folks. You want to hear God? You want to know God's will for your life? Make sure you're attuned to Him. He'll show you. He will. And then there's the good soil. And it speaks to those who are tuned to the frequency. We've, we've seen the Pharisees. We've seen two examples of those on the outside chasing the world. And now we have a picture of those on the inside. Those who are tuned to Jesus, who, who began to understand the message because they are focused on one thing and one thing only. Jesus Christ. The story is told of an individual waiting to be in, interviewed for a job as a wireless operator, a telegraph operator. A group of applicants paid little attention to the sound of dots and dashes which began coming over the intercom, the loudspeaker. Suddenly, one of them rushed into the employer's office. Soon he returned smiling. I got it, he exclaimed. The others looked in dismay. How did you get ahead of us, they asked. He said, you might have been considered if you hadn't been so busy talking that you didn't hear the manager's message, coded message. He replied, it said, the man I need must always be on the alert. The first one who interprets this and comes directly to my private office will be hired. This whole group of people, and only one, was tuned to the right frequency. And they received the reward. They earned the job. So the question becomes, are we tuned to the right frequency so that we can know and understand all that God has for us? So how can we know? What can we do to make sure, sure we are tuned to the proper frequency? Very quickly. One thing you can do is ask yourself, what's the first thing I think of when I awaken in the morning? Is it Jesus or my job? Is it Jesus or the news of the day? Is it the newspaper? I've got to have my morning newspaper. I can't, can't get on with the day without reading the comic strips or the sports section. Is that where I think of first? Or ask yourself, what's the last thing I think of at night? Is it Jesus? Or is it, oh, here's what's waiting for me tomorrow. And you toss and turn all night instead of resting and being prepared for the next day. When you're faced with with a decision, what's, what's truly right and what's truly wrong? Do you first sit down and just weigh out the pros and cons? Write them down on a piece of paper? And see which one comes out and you decide, well, that's right. Do you choose to feel sorry for yourself? Do you listen more to the peer pressure? Oh, my friends, they, they think this is the way it is, so I'm going to follow them instead of trying to find out the right answer. Or do you step back? Do you pause and do you spend a little time in prayer with God? When trouble comes, is your first inclination 
to solve it on your own. I can do this. I can get through this. I don't need anybody else. Do you choose to feel sorry for yourself and wonder, why me? What? There's plenty of other people that are worse than me. They deserve this, not, not me. Or do you, you, like Jesus, choose to go to a solitary place and seek God? There's no better example of Jesus doing exactly that. He's faced with, with the impending death. There's nothing worse. And Jesus takes those closest to him and he goes to a garden. And he tells most of them, you stay here. And he takes three more a little further and he tells them, you stay here. And he goes off further by himself. And he prays, Father, if there's another way, let it be but if this is the way it has to be, then let it be. And I will honor you. And I will serve you. And we know what Jesus did. He went to a cross. He laid down his life because he sought the guidance of the one who sent him, the one he trusted the most. The heart of those who are truly on the inside, that are truly followers of Jesus Christ, have come to a point in their life where they echo the words of Paul as he was heading into the city of Corinth. And he said, I will know nothing save Jesus Christ and him crucified. I will listen only to him. And I will trust him with my life. And when troubles come, I will trust him. And if I die, Paul said to live is Christ. <laughs> to die is gain. I will trust him with everything. My mind goes back also to, to Elijah hiding on the side of a mountain. And there's a big ruckus and fire and the earth's rumbling and there's all kind of noise around him and he doesn't hear God in the rumbling. And he goes out another time and there's, there's a storm. And there's thunder and there's lightning and there's trouble. There's trouble in the world and there's trouble for Elijah. But he doesn't hear the voice of God in the storm. No, he has to wait. Till he's alone and it's quiet. And in that moment, he hears the still small whisper of God. And you know what Elijah does? He gets back to work. He gets back to work. Four soils, things that distract, that cause us to lose our focus, to be tuned to the wrong frequency. Three of those soils, those distractions, lead us to missing Christ and His message. And that's a tragedy. Because only in Christ is there life. Only one brings us to the heart of the Savior. Let me leave you with the words of Jesus. 
words recorded to a church, a real church during the first century, found in Revelation 3.20, and it says this, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. If we're not tuned to the right frequency, Jesus can stand at that door our entire life and knock. And we will never hear it. We have to be sure that we are tuned to God. And we do that by making sure that nothing presses Him out of the center of our lives. He, it, nothing sways us from following Him into every struggle. Because He has promised to go with us. We tune to His frequency when we trust and read His Word. So the question today is, what frequency are you listening to? Is it your hard-fought conviction of you're right and nothing else matters? Is it your fear of your fellow man and the peer pressure and all of those things? Is it if he was a loving God, he would be there when I'm, when I'm in trouble and I struggle, and he'd take all of that away instead of telling me, there's something in this I need you to learn. Or are you listening? And are you following? And are you serving? What are you tuned to? Let's pray. Abba Father, thank you for the words of Jesus, his teaching through story. Father, may we be a people who are tuned to you and to him. That we would block out the distractions around us, that we would open our hearts, that your spirit would speak with ours, that we might understand. Father, if there's one here today that isn't tuned to that frequency, your frequency. Allow your spirit to work in their lives today. That they may begin to hear and to begin to understand and to know that in Jesus and Jesus alone is life. All other things lead to destruction and death. Be with us that we might go out. Tune to your frequency that we might help others retune theirs. In Jesus' name, amen. We come to that time of response. And the question you have to ask and answer is the one Jesus, I believe, is asking us. Are you tuned to me? If not, Maybe now is the time he's calling you to step out in faith for the first time and accept him as Lord and Savior. If not, maybe he's calling you back because you've strayed. Whatever it is, are you listening? Are you focused? Are you tuned? This time of response is for those of you that might watch us later online as well. Give us a call here at the church. We'd love to get to know you and, and to share with you and, and to share God's love with you and to help you to begin to turn the dial that will clear up the, the static and the noise that you might come to know Jesus. Would you please stand as we sing?